do I hunt? Yeah. Not fully as much as I'd like to, but uh, it's definitely in the cards for us because our property is, we, we could live off wild game here year round easily. Yeah. We, we have yeah. white tailed deer, mule deer, turkeys, moose, elk, sometimes elk, bear, though I don't like really like bear meat, um, tons of grouse. Uh, we have so much wild game out here, man. It's it's amazing. I people will ask me if I hunt. That's pretty much a pretty close second question, you know. Do, do you have goats? Once they find out your homestead, and I I tell them though, I don't hunt. I don't have a problem with it, but it's like I'm a control freak. I like to, you know, raise them to this amount of date. We're gonna go pull the trigger at nine and slit the throat, and we're gonna be done within four or five hours yeah. or whatever it is. <laughs> It's more I like that too. Yeah. But I, like I was thinking too. about it. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, I like that too. I only really raise birds right now for livestock up here. Ruminant animals are kind of tricky on my land right now. Uh, once yeah. I have been here longer and my pastures are more dialed in, maybe, yeah, maybe like one milk cow, but I doubt that even I'm in a mountain region, you know, like you, your climate is so different than mine because you're temperate and you got natural grass everywhere. That's not yeah. like that up in these mountains. Yeah, I was, uh, we're definitely going to get into your off grid story and how you went from the urban, the urban guy to this wild terrain, um, uh, out in the wild. But, uh, uh, when you said, okay, so when I went, I went and harvested our bull. So we had had this guy for six years. We got him when we got back from the great American farm tour. So we bond with this mm -hmm. guy when you're doing regenerative, you're moving them every day. You have a relationship. He becomes a friend yeah well that's hard to pull the trigger yeah on this guy six years later and i'm think you know i'm thinking that's really not if you look at the grand scheme of things that the indigenous people and whatnot they didn't have these relations these like it, they had a relationship you know what i'm saying they seem more oh, I don't yeah. know, animalistic or, well, or like, spiritual uh, uh but it, to shoot something in the wild is you didn't have a relationship with it yeah you do in a different way though and you know mm. as a as an admirer of indigenous cultures they do in a way in that in indigenous cultures i can't speak for all of them but at least the ones in yeah. canada that i'm familiar with it is a relationship with the land as a whole and um that's even what uh you know that's where canada technically got its name was when some of the settlers asked the 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 natives if that was their land and they and and they didn't under they don't understand they didn't have the mm -hmm. idea of property you know but they had the idea of the land and this connection to the creator and this abundance that comes from the land and so they had it in a different way you know and 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 they really do give reverence for the animals and we try to do that too as, as best as we can you know sometimes you just got to get things done you know you got to churn yeah. through a lot of birds you know but um no i i, I think that existed and, and it's definitely the same for us but yeah, I mean, what you're describing in a way is the difference between a horticultural and an agricultural society, you know? Yeah. To Toby Hemingway, uh, you know, wrote about that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, well, it's kind of like, I was just thinking through, you know, we're, we're on this journey because, oh, we want to eat more organic or, or regenerative or holistic, natural. But really, if you think about over time, is it really natural to captivate an animal and build a relationship? and then harvest i don't know well it is if you control it you know if, <laughs> if, you, if you the way you're doing it i i think it's as natural as it can get yeah uh, but that's what i do like about wild game over say raised animals is that they're not even eating feed you know even with our yeah. as much as i would like to be raising my animals 100 percent off my land it's not quite there yet yeah. maybe it's two-thirds of the way there but i still got that feed in there a bit and you can control that as best as you can, but at the same time, only so much. Whereas with wild game, it's 100% from the land. And I think there's something that's pretty compelling about that idea in general. I hear you. I hear you. I don't know if I, I, I can do that here. I think you're so remote, but here we're surrounded by GMO corn. I know. And so, so yeah. we're killing GMO fed deer. It's crazy. I know it's true. It's true. And that's, yeah, that's part of the reason why we decided to live as remote as we are. And, you know, we're not that remote, but compared yeah. to you in North Carolina, 
significantly, you know, a hundred, yeah. hundred to one difference. Yeah. Um, so, but that also presents challenges too, in the off grid way, you know, it's harder for me to get resources. Um, yeah. I got to drive further to get stuff, you know, Amazon doesn't deliver to my door, you know, um, I have things like that, but at the same time, I like that. I grew up in the bush, you know, I grew up, uh, as my, in my twenties, I did tree planting. That was a, you know, very Canadian job oh, really? to go and plant trees in the bush in clear cuts. Um, I planted over a million trees with my hands and, what? uh, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it takes, sometimes you're planting a tree in two seconds, you know, you're cranking it. I'd plant thousands a day, but, um, yeah, we're in the bush and, and I like that. That's how I grew up. Uh, my, you know, my early adulthood and teenage years was in the bush and there's something that's just comforting to me about it. Well, a lot of, a lot of people know you as the suburban gardener, yeah, the urban gardener. I know. So, so how, farmer, why did yeah. you, why did you, so, 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 so for people to get perspective and where we're going with the stories, like you were, uh, in the bush, grew up in the bush, planting a million trees, suburbia, what happened? Why did you move to town? Yeah. <laughs> well, this you're going to end in, up back. It's a full circle. Well, you know, you know, the, the, the bush, the bush work was a day job for me. I did that okay. to put myself as that, I, that, that funded my music career for 10 years. So for 10 years of my life, I was completely dedicated to building a career. I mean, in, in a way, like you had a totally different thing before you got into being Justin Rhodes. You had the, oh, yeah. the, the mountain boarding thing, right? Yeah. So my my thing was I was uh, I was trying to make a career out of being a full-time musician. And, and I was going at that in a couple different ways. One was I was just gigging. I was playing gigs for money. Uh, I played in a band. And that was kind of my passion project. But then I was trying to build a career as a, a music uh film composer running scores. Wow. And I was really into the kind of contemporary classical music scene, I guess, jazz as well. But um, that's what I was doing. And tree planting paid for that because I wasn't making much money doing that. I was living in Montreal. And um, so I would go out West, plant trees for two to four months a year, make a ton of money. I'd make, you know, five, six times more dollars than anybody I knew in a very short period of time. And then it afforded me this great lifestyle in Montreal where I could just be a full-time musician available to play any gig, anytime I was on the scene, you know, that involved some unhealthy aspects as well. But, you know, I started to really think about my food in 2008 going, man, society is uh, unstable. And I witnessed one time in Montreal, a freezing rainstorm where the grocery store was literally empty. And there was a short period, about two or three days where people were really starting to panic and get unsettled. And that's what kind of woke me up to the importance of food. And then I started buying, you know, Bill Mollison, Jeff Lawton and David Holmgren and, and uh, Michael Reynolds and the human handbook with Joseph Jenkins. I just went down the rabbit hole with this stuff that inspired me to get into farming. But the reason I became an urban farmer, which was to your question was I had no means to get on land. I wanted to do it in British Columbia. Land is so expensive out here still. Mm. And I thought, well, this urban farming thing, I heard about a guy in Saskatoon, Canada doing it. I could do that. I'm a hard worker. I, I you know tree planting is hard work. It was a real test of my, uh, my ability to work hard in, in unforgivable circumstances. And so I thought, let's do this urban farming thing because I could just start. People will lend me their backyards and boom. So it was a way for me just to get into something and leverage my sort of experiential and social capital to a financial capital means at that time. Yeah. And then, uh, what year was that? That would have, I started the farm in 2009, fall of 2009. And then I had it ready for selling crops, yeah. uh, early 2010. So you cranked it out and, um, from 2009 to when I came and saw you, in 2017 yeah i think i met you at a permaculture voices conference that's right uh, uh, oh and, yeah and i think i had your contact or something and arranged to come see you we were sick as dogs you were you guys you were remember. all down you, and out. Was, i do remember yeah i don't think i've ever been so sick in my life and uh i remember filming one of those days i was even still feeling down uh, but the video took off. It ended up being a popular video. It went great. Totally. Um, okay. So when we were there, 
I don't know if you were thinking about the wild mountains then, but it did seem like you were kind no. of on the verge of a transition. Maybe you're at least, you at least found a couple of business guys that, that now you're still in relationship with, I think. Yeah. And then, yeah. um, so tell me what happened from there. You know, I'm visiting the urban COVID. gardener that the, COVID, oh, COVID happened. happened. <laughs> well, okay, it, so, so, you know, 2017, you were there. I was still cranking doing the business full time. Also, you know, starting to make a living doing YouTube content and stuff like that. My book had been out for a year at that point. Um, 2018, I officially closed the farm because my my other side of the career uh, took off. But um, and I was still homesteading in that urban place. Uh, I, re I renovated it and put a lot more into it after you'd left. Um, but when COVID happened, I just realized, you know, it was about six months into those lockdowns. No, it was less than that. It was, it was a couple months into those lockdowns so that I realized we don't want to live in the city anymore. This is all our neighbors are becoming paranoid and, you know, mm -hmm. we don't take vaccines and stuff like that. So I was just, I was, this is not looking good. You know, the world, I'm a very social guy. I know all my neighbors. I'm, I'm friends with everybody. And I just saw people go paranoid and crazy. And I'm, and I said, I don't want my, cause I, we just had our son at that point, our second child. And uh, we're like, no, we don't want this kind of lifestyle for our kids. We don't want to see us getting in arguments with people about masks and all this. So we yeah. started looking really aggressively in that spring of 2020 and then we found this place. I mean, I looked, Justin, I looked everywhere, man. I, I was, and that's this course that we'll talk about later is a big part of, of what I learned during that journey. Cause I combed hundreds of properties. I visited at least, I don't know, 20 or 30. And, um, I learned a lot about looking for properties as I did in my consulting and farming practice for years too. But, but so that's kind of where the journey off grid began. So we, 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 we scoured all over the province. We knew we wanted to stay in BC Though we could have moved to other places. We had the option. I make a living online. You know, we could have gone to Mexico or moved to the U.S. even. We wanted to stay here. So we found this place in southern B.C. It was totally over or undervalued because it was off-grid. It didn't have a consistent form of water mm. that was reliable. And it had uh, a challenging access, a, a kilometer-long driveway. You know, that's a sixth of a mile that goes up about uh, 200 feet of elevation. And I liked all of those things. And so I got this property as a, as a, at a steal of a deal because nobody else saw the value in it. But the thing is, I could tell right away that there was water there. It just needed to be found. It wasn't that I could, I, I flew my drone up, looked at the topography. I was like, yeah, this place is, is a gem because we get so much snow here. We can capture snow melt. So even mm. if I wasn't able to drill a well, which I did since then, anyways, I would be able to capture 10 million liters of water from snow melt a year easily. And that's what I'm doing now because I've got two ponds here. There's been a whole three year journey on this uh, this property. But uh, go ahead. Was uh, when you say you were locked down in in Canada, I've heard it was pretty strict. What did that look like for you in that in town? Well, you know, it wasn't as bad like, as maybe the, it, the, yeah. the news made it seem, but um, it was unpleasant. Um, we weren't enforced or forced to do anything against our will, nothing like that. It was just that. Every time we went to the grocery store and we we refused to wear masks uh, and my wife yeah. uh, never wore one. My children never wore them ever, still have not. Um, and there were times where because I was building and doing construction at the time, you know, a year after we bought this place, I would go into these hardware stores and they wouldn't let me in without wearing a mask. So what I would do is just put my shirt up like this, but it was stupid. You have to go through the motions and play this dumb game. And then you get people and it was rarely ever the business or the government or police or anything like that. It was other people that were so brainwashed to be so afraid of this virus, alleged, alleged virus that they would freak out on you. And, and I had multiple times where I was out with my kids and my wife and people would get in my face, especially cause I'm the man. Yeah. They would mm -hmm. get in my face and it got, it, oh it wasn't plus. Yeah, it was terrible. I'm so glad that that phase of time is over. Um, yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So I won't, I won't dwell on it too long. But you know, I, I figured out how to. Uh, I saw, I saw a guy uh, in Lowe's. This is how you, if you don't want to be bothered. I don't know if you can legally do this in Canada, but we went to Lowe's, and here's this guy. He's barefoot. He's got a pistol on his side, 
and he's got no mask. I mean, you don't go and tell that guy to put on a mask. <laughs> I love that. He was open Yeah, yeah, carrying. we don't have open carry in Canada, but we we do oh, have okay. lots. You can you can have guns in Canada no problem. We don't have open carry like some of the states down there. Uh but no, I mean we we did it in our own ways. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've learned a lot about the law over the years, especially during COVID. Um and okay. we were we did whatever we wanted, you know. The the, the remedies oh. were right in the statutes and the mask mandate article 4 clearly says, you know, you, you if you have a medical reason, you don't have to wear a mask and it doesn't say anything about what that medical reason is. Mm. It just says it and yeah, I got a medical reason, I need to breathe air. And so yeah. you don't have to justify <laughs> it to anybody. So all these fines they handed out, they all got turned back. It was all a bunch of BS. No, you know, the, none of it stood up in the courts. It, and it's the same thing with all the latest stuff they're trying. It's just a bunch of BS. Uh, why? I'm curious as to why you felt at this moment we could go anywhere. You had mentioned Mexico, America, yeah, Canada. Yeah. What are you rooted in Canada? Is that like are born, raised, going to be buried there? Born, raised, you have yeah, an affection yeah, yeah. For it. Yeah, in BC too. I mean, I love the landscape. I'm adapted to it. I I know the flora and fauna. You know, I feel like if I was going to survive in the bush, like say just total Bushman style, this would be my best place to do it. If I were just to be thrown down in North Carolina where you are, I don't understand the animals. Yeah. I don't understand the migratory patterns of things. I don't, you know, here I, I understand it. So there was that, but also it's kind of like uh, the devil, you know, versus the devil. you yeah. don't. And so the government's the devil and, you know, I'm a free, I'm a free enterprise, free market kind of guy you know, much in the kin of Joel Salatin and, and whatnot. And so I, I prefer the devil I know, and I understand the devil here. And uh, Canada is a great place to actually be free if you understand it. Okay. And, you know, it's, uh, we love it here. Yeah, we could, I could have gone anywhere. Um, I could have gone to the U.S. because I had obviously businesses running there for years, still do. Um, and I thought about it. And I, and I think maybe at some point I might, if I, if I do well enough for myself, I might buy a little place down in Arkansas or Tennessee, and go down there six months of the year and then come back up here. You know what I mean? Would that be to just come and, and be warm? Um, Maybe, you know, I, probably a bit of both. I, I mean, I always mix business and pleasure and, you know, I like doing business and I like traveling, but I, I really like homestead real estate. You know, it's a really, it's a thing I've okay. become really passionate about. And I think at some point, I'd like to get to a, a place where I'm actually just developing homesteads and then selling them. Oh, okay. Coming in, doing all the earthworks, putting in buildings or upgrading the buildings, making the properties off grid, put in the food systems, water systems, you know, all that stuff, and basically sell a turnkey solution for people. Sorry, a, an agrarian bunker, if you will, as a, you know, Joel Salatin yeah. puts it, um, and do something like that because I enjoy it. I mean, now I'm three years on this build as a general contractor. I'm going, man, I want to do this again because then I could get it better, I could do it right. And and the builder that I've had up here for the last little while, he's been amazing. He's he's built probably 60 homes, um, mm. almost entirely himself. And uh, he's built four for himself. He just built the fourth one. And he says to me, and he just finished it. He said, and he's living in it now. He said, uh, if I were to do it again tomorrow, I'd finally get it perfect. Mm. So five homes to get it perfect. So I think what I'd like to do is build at least five homesteads. And then maybe on that fifth one, get it completely perfect. And then that might be the one that I keep. For the Where are you going to do that at? Oh, yo, so you would actually go and live in these for a little Dude, while. All over. I, I'd love to do it. Absolutely. I'd love to go down to Arkansas, spend, you know, a year and then kind of commute back and forth a bit here and there, but get the contractor set up, build the property and then enjoy it for a little while, then flip it, then move to the next one. And then just kind of keep adding value. I'd love to do that. That's a good idea. Rebecca and I have thought about that. We were like, we would be like, honey, you do the do the house, the design, and I'll do the outside permaculture setup. Yeah. I found uh, around here though, we 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 a property came available, and we were like, okay, let's go see what it would. You know, we were kind of thinking in that mindset of like something close to our house, but it was like I want to say uh, ten acres, maybe six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, but you're. I think you're probably looking in the right places. At least with East Tennessee, I don't know what the pricing is. And why did you? I should say this because we're probably gonna have a lot of uh, people listening from the United States, and you've done a lot of research. Why did you pick Arkansas and Tennessee? 
Well, I would even say Arkansas above Tennessee. Okay. So, why? The why? U, the U, well, um, supply and demand for the most part. So Tennessee is a great state. If, if, I, if I could pick one state, I'd want to be in probably up against the Blue Ridge Mountains sort of thing on the, on the yeah. uh, eastern East. side of Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Love, love that landscape. Love the topography. Love the flora and fauna. Love the people. I love the South. Um, and, uh, but a lot of people during COVID from California moved to Tennessee and mm-hmm. the prices have gone to the roof. North Carolina too. Forget about it. I mean, I don't even, oh, I yeah. really Western look North Carolina. North no, Carolina. forget about it. It's, it, it's, it's way too overinflated. However, the Ozark, I mean, this is, this is valuable information for folks. The Ozark region, uh, from call it, um, Southeastern Missouri, there's that sliver that goes down through Arkansas, northeastern Arkansas, is some of the most premium homestead real estate in the U.S. right now. It value, climate, topography, soil, water, um, unbelievable what you can get in that region. And we and so we we showcase and and I look at hundreds of listings every single week. Our you know, Freedom Farmers, now we do this new thing called the Homestead Accelerator. And it came out of this course that I built called the uh, Finding the Perfect Homestead Property, which basically teaches people my process using the 11 scales of permanence, which you're probably familiar with, Eric Townsmere, and uh, came came out of uh, PA Yeoman's eight scales of permanence. They added um, 11. And so we use that as a full spectrum analysis, look at property. And so we, I built this course teaching people how to do this. And then I had a lot of people reach out to me and be like, hey, why don't you guys just publish listings in a directory? And so we started doing it. And mm-hmm. it's really cool because the research, the information is amazing, but also just really getting a deep understanding of the United States topography is, is just fascinating for me. And, 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 I, and I love it. I'm obsessed with it now. And I'm obsessed with that region, Missouri, Arkansas, um, parts of Tennessee, um, you can even get into Alabama and Mississippi, also really great properties as well, if you can handle the humidity. Um, yeah. and so that's what I kind of like about going a little bit further North, that Northeastern arc or Northwestern, sorry, Northwestern Arkansas into Missouri is just a golden zone. And, um, yeah, if I had to pick one place right now, that's where it would be. Uh, be just mostly because of the value. Sure, I'd get Tennessee, but Tennessee's getting harder to find good properties in and at good size. I like large acreage. I like 40 acres, 20 acres minimum, depending on the topography, but I really like 40 plus and even 100 acres. Like we're finding 100 acre lots in Arkansas that you could split up into three subdivides and do really well on. Like 400,000 for 100 acres, prime land, sometimes even with a house on it in Arkansas. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And parts of Missouri too. Missouri is amazing. And so I like the culture of t- Missouri too. You know, I like yeah. the open carry. I like, I like the, the real oh. freedom minded people, you know, they almost pay you to be there. The taxes are so low. Uh, now I was on the farm tour there and I was riding around with the guy and I'm used to like North Carolina, you're here in Western North Carolina. Nobody's from here. Everybody's from somewhere else. We, we vacation yeah. in Florida. Nobody's from Florida. Everybody's from somewhere else. Rebecca's from Florida, but it's rare that you find somebody. And so I was asking this Missouri guy and that was the way it was in a lot of places, Texas, Maine, whatever. And I said to him, I said, well, where are you from? And he looked at me and said, Justin, nobody moves to Missouri. <laughs> but I'm telling people it's it's an underrated homestead state because of its freedom and yeah. its tax rate. But it gets so hot and it gets so cold. But, I mean, you got to just get some air conditioning and some heat and you'll be all right, right? Although See, for me, that's that's nothing. The, the 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 variance in hot and cold in that oh, climate not? for me is not compared to what we deal with up here in the boreal climates nothing really? like it at all what oh, do you deal so with up mild. there well in the boreal region you go from really cold winter and tons of snow to hot and dry summers whereas in the temperate regions which is which you're in that most yeah. of Missouri is in it's it's it, the, the swing in temperatures is way less but you have swings in humidity and humidity is often what makes things sort of unbearable when you think about a Missouri summer or a North Carolina summer. It's that humidity, right? Is that the temperature is not 
that hot, but when you get into like yeah. 90 plus humidity, it's unbearable. And then, yeah, but like you said, air conditioning and, you know, a good wood stove can, can, can do it. Well, we should talk about it. air conditioning. Can you do, I almost felt like, wait, should I say air conditioning? Can you do air conditioning off, off grid? grid? Absolutely. I mean, off for us off grid, you know, we have 20 kilowatts of solar and okay. any extra thing to spend electricity on in the summer is nothing because we oh we have so much excess electricity in the summer it's okay. the winter you know it's the winter where i'm not dedicating any kilowatt hours towards climate control so in the winter we're all wood 100% wood uh propane is a backup but um yeah it's all wood up here which is amazing because i've got 30 acres of standing timber that i can manage for my entire life and my children will if we're if we're good stewards on the land here which we intend to be my children will be doing the same thing and we'll be able to harvest trees from this forest forever and only make it better as a result. Cause as you know, you, you probably know this, but most forests in North America are too dense and yeah. it's good land stewardship to thin them because it reduces your fire risk. It increases the um, mo mobility through the forest so that I can go through animals can go through. We can build, we can, we can help foster good soil health in the forest by animals, right? As you know, bringing, bringing pigs through there, bringing goats through there, sheep. Um, and so the more we can, you know, horticulturally manage our forests, the better they're going to be, the more fire resilient they're going to be. And that's the thing we have to deal with in the boreal climates is softwood trees burn and they're intended to burn. And that's part of the natural cycle, but um, good management can, can, can help with that. Yeah. And what I hear he here is you're there. You're you're talking about your children being there and being on the land. Is that in your heart? Are you going to be buried there? I mean, in the Probably. sense of like... I, 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 I think I'd rather be... Well, yeah, no, I, I would be buried here, actually, now that you think about it. Because there's some pretty neat legal stuff you get when you uh, bury somebody on your property. You get some... Uh, oh, really? Some good, yeah, some good property protections from that. I've heard... That, yeah, uh, I would ask you, that, one, is it legal? Because it's not always legal, I don't think. I don't know. Yeah, what's legal and what's lawful don't always align. And and sometimes, most of the That's time, right. what's lawful is what's right and what's legal is often wrong. But the devil's in the details, as they say. So yeah. those kinds of things don't intimidate me. I've learned enough about Canadian law now that you know I can pretty much look at most of it and just see how it's so full of holes and, and BS that there's usually a remedy wow. for everything as long as you're in the right standing and as long as you're in honor and you're you're doing things properly um we can kind of live as we want as we're intended to be you know yeah i don't want to can of worms on that conversation though but <laughs> i know we we could go down there if we need to won't, won't we did, did did um what i'm getting at there is you're i'll ask people that and mostly people are I don't want to say flighty, but they're not necessarily committed yeah. to, to their death. They're not settled. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of rare to tell you the truth because you, at least when I was at homesteading events and people would come through the line, where are you from? And then I would, you know, then say, are you going to be buried there? And there, people are almost thrown off. Maybe they're thinking like, I, you know, what I'm trying to say is, are you going to live there until the end? Yeah, and I think so. On to your never children. say never. I know I'd like you're talking to. about Arkansas, you're talking about um, East Tennessee, but uh, those feels like biz those are more business adventures for you, I would imagine, right? Yeah, I think so. My heart, and, my heart is in this climate. I love the winter too. We're big ski and snowboarders and stuff, and so we really thrive in the winter and we really enjoy it. And so yeah. I think you know, at this point we're kind of getting a little sick of it. We got a little bit of snow coming in right now, but that's inevitable, you know. But I do enjoy the four seasons. I really do, okay. and uh, it because it's it's a it's a new four, four times a year. You know, it feels like a new thing. Whereas in temperate climates, it's kind of two times a year. It's like there's summer and there's winter. You know, and yeah, winter is like just a wet period, and and summer is your hot and humid period. So it's it's different up here, and I I like that. Yeah, I was scrolling through your uh your sales page. Uh, where is this, by the way? Your your course is it on Freedom Farmers? Or is it yep. somewhere else? Yep. Okay. Freedomfarmers.com. Yep. 
So that's what I was looking at then. I was looking at freedomfarmers.com. I was looking at this course. And one thing you address in this course is the uh, it's lonely. Uh, it, and yeah, so homesteading is lonely, but then you take homesteading to another level, level and you go off grid and you, you said you don't even get, Amazon won't even deliver there? No, but it's, I can still get Amazon stuff. I just have to it's, pick it up at like our rural post office. Wow, our, our rural, yeah. Uh, Post box. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted that Justin, because, you know, um, you know, you've experienced a bit of this too yourself. Like, yeah. you know, we're, we're semi-famous people and, yeah. uh, you know, I get recognized everywhere I go, literally everywhere I go, yeah. especially in the United States. Like it's, uh, in Canada, I still do. I can't even go out to the hardware store in my little town and not have people recognize me. So I had for many years, uh, even though it was doing the urban farming thing, um, you know, right downtown and people would literally from around the world would just knock on my door. <laughs> and so yeah. mm -hmm. it got a little, it got a little annoying as much as I'm grateful that people are, you know, they yeah. want to meet me and they they value my content, of course, but I just, I really valued privacy. And so we wanted to live really tucked away and, and not, we're not isolated because we have a lot of community around us and um, we've got friends everywhere. We were talking about uh, folks coming by uninvited. Yes. Um, it's interesting. We, me and my tech guy were talking about that last night. It's called, I didn't know there was a name for it, but it's called parasocial relationship. They know you and have a sense of you, Yes. but you don't know them. Yes. And they really do have a relationship with you. And they know you, what you're presenting is truth. And uh, oftentimes you're sharing some real, uh, you know, I, I've seen some of your stuff, you sharing some real, you know, stuff from conviction. And yeah, so they, and they, 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 they connect with that and you're being vulnerable and they connect with that and, um, they know you, but you don't know them. And you know what, you know, the thing that kind of was the straw that broke the camel's back with that is yeah as you said these parasocial relationships is the thing that we got weird and a little creepy and was a big part of we need to get out of the city and get you know and i wanted to have a this this all came from us talking about having a really inaccessible driveway and have a you know being kind of really tucked out of the way uh is that i made the mistake early on of having my baby in my videos and people were really can having these parasocial relationships with my child mm. and then that's just where i didn't i didn't feel comfortable and and and, and katie as the mama bear what didn't like that and it was and so that's when you're like okay yeah if we have a property we're gonna have a property that's you know you can't just slide by my place like yeah. my driveway is on a on a real back road and yeah. you wouldn't even recognize it from the base of it because there's it, it goes up into a forest and it looks like nothing and so that's how I wanted it. And, you know, at the same time, bringing this back to where we were talking about properties and whatnot is that that, that was valuable to me, but probably not valuable to somebody else. And so right. I got a crazy deal on this property because I saw things in it that were valuable to me, but not someone else. So the off grid thing I wanted, I wanted to do that anyways. A challenge with water, I wanted that challenge, you know, I wanted to be able to drill a well or build ponds and do that kind of stuff, do the real permaculture stuff, the earthworks, you know, getting the snow melt into the, the, the riparian areas and into the ponds. And then I wanted the privacy. And yes, my driveway has cost me almost $100,000 at this point. But um, I like that. I like that privacy. Can you see any neighbors from your place? No, nice. I can see part of one of their properties, but it's a part of their property that they don't live on. And so, no, it's, it's complete privacy. I mean, we can literally, I mean, it's not that we do, but we could naked garden every single day and we don't have to answer to anybody. You know, we don't have people yeah. driving by looky loos and, and I like that, you know, it's also really nice for peace of mind and just being able to totally relax and just feel like you're in your own space. And it, it's, it's a magical thing, especially with kids, you know, and being able to feel safe with them walking around and yeah, we've got wild yeah. animals out here, but we've got a big fence. We, I, we put, put a big 2,400 foot linear foot of fence in with electrical wire on, 
the top and bottom of it. So bears can't climb it. And, you know, we've got that, uh, that security and it's, it's really nice. Is Katie on board with this hundred percent? Totally. She, she, she waxes and wanes as, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, it was my vision, you know, um, <laughs> but she trusted me and she wanted to be part of the journey. She loves she, she, you know, even though she was an urbanite, you know, she lived in Vancouver for most of her adult life until we got together in 2014. Um, she liked the health aspect though, and us being able to control as much of our con call it holistic context as possible. She really liked that. And she, we're big into the homeschooling and unschooling and all that. And so she's really big into having the forest as being the teacher. And our, and our kids really learn in the forest. And my daughter's an expert mushroom, mushroom picker. She can find anything. Mm. And my boy is a lot younger, so he's, he's finding, finding his way. Um, but, uh, yeah, we love that about this place. What's the pain point for somebody who's, what is, what is the, what is the pain point that you're seeing people have to overcome or people getting burnt out? Yeah. Well, that's it, dude. I mean, it's, it's, it's burnout. We saw it after COVID, um, you know, from 2020 to 2022, there was a mad dash in real estate. And uh, it was a really interesting time because that's kind of when I really got my feet wet with understanding the game better, understanding realtors. I talked to dozens of realtors and I'm the kind of guy who just calls people. Like I don't Google search things. I just call people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, that's how I've learned a lot of things over time. And talking to so many people and during that period the, the realtors were calling them calling us covid buyers so there's all these people getting out of the cities and trying to buy properties and doing the off-grid thing and so there was a mad dash to do that during that time and a lot of people are selling those properties now and mm -hmm. so and i even see it in the u.s you guys had the same thing that all over um and some states worse than others but i remember washington state when we start, first started looking at properties up there and northeastern Washington is a gold mine for topography, climate. It's beautiful. It's a warmer boreal climate. Um, and uh, we saw so many properties listed that you could tell it was a real just um, flying by the seat of their pants off grid, you know, cabins, uh, RV pads, uh, really DIY uh, pit wells, um, real ad hoc, you know, off grid solar systems and stuff like that. We saw for... A lot of those properties are sold now and they sold at a steal of a deal. But a lot mm. of properties we saw in Northeastern Washington were unbelievable value, half houses and stuff like that. And so you're still seeing that. I think in Canada in particular, um, the real estate market's going to shake a lot of those people out. This The beginning is this year because Canada, you know, mortgages are a scam already, but mortgages in Canada are a double scam because, you know, the mm. bank made printed the money out of nothing, you know, that's fractional reserve lending. You go and put a $50,000 deposit and then they can lend you back 500,000 and you pay the interest and the money never existed until you put your money down. That's a mortgage. But in Canada, you got to renew the interest rate every five years. Oh, so yeah. if you, if you take a 25 year mortgage and they amortize it, they amortize the monthly payment based on the total years, but then you go in at this interest rate payment, and then that calculates the monthly payment you're going to make on your interest and principal for the next five years. But then in five years, it all comes up to renewal. So in 2019, beginning from 2019, 2020, and 2021, the most amount of homeowner uh, purchases in Canadian history were made. Actually, it was 2019 in particular. It was like 68.9% of people who bought a home were a homeowner. So that means they're living in the home. So they bought a home at 1.7, sometimes it's 1.4 interest rate. Now those <laughs> interest rates are six and a half, seven percent. So how's that going to change your monthly payment on a million dollar property? Because Canadian real estate is so overvalued. A million dollar property at 1.5, go and do a mortgage calculator and you can figure it out. And then you go to renew at almost triple the interest rate. You're talking double or more of a mortgage payment every month. And that's going to put a lot of people out of their homes, which is tragic and sad. Um, but if you see it coming and you can start and prepare for that outcome, you might come out with a really good property for cheap. 
And a lot of people were just turning, burning these. What do you teach people to do then inside the course? What do they do if they're not going to get, are are they getting, are you having them get mortgages or are you finding other ways? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we, I don't touch finance as far as what okay. I teach people, you know, that's up to them. Um, but uh, what I teach people in, in our finding the perfect homestead property course is how to evaluate property. So basically what we look at are 11 things. And so they're also known as the uh, 11 scales of permanence. This is, you know, this is permaculture 101 in a way. Um, but what we, what we do is we first teach people about understanding their context. Cause you know, in permaculture, your context dictates everything. So that's your barometer of where you go. And then what we do is we teach them what to look for, for threats. So when you're looking for a property, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure it's, it's the right property for you. Like it, 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 it meets the, the, the basic checklists of your negotiables and non-negotiables. But then the first thing you want to do is look for threats. Is there a CAFO a kilometer away? You know, is what's the driveway look like? Um, are you downstream from a forestry clear cut? Um, is there a mine yeah. right around the corner? Is there oil and gas drilling that might compromise your well water? You know, the whole litany, litany of things uh, we look for. Power lines, you know, cell phone towers. Absolutely. Power lines fracking. that are too close. Cell towers, fracking. Exactly. Uh, and, and conventional large-scale ag. I mean, you know, this is why when yeah. I talk about Missouri, I'm not talking about um, – the other part of Missouri that's brown and full of big ag fields, I'm talking about the parts in the trees. This is why I prefer rural properties. So there's, you know, land is divided into four categories. Typically, there's urban, suburban, peri-urban, and rural, right? And so when I was farming, uh, it was suburban, technically. I was the urban farmer, but I was technically suburban farming. And um, peri-urban is where most farms are. You know, you think about that whole strip along the Mississippi river on both sides in the U S okay. it's full of big ag, right? It's, or you think about central Valley, California, big ag, don't live in big ag, live higher elevation, closer to the end of the mountains and where there's more trees. So that's what I encourage people to look for in general. And we showcase all kinds of different properties, but generally like when I'm talking about prepping and getting out of the way, you don't want to be in big ag country because it's full of risks. And so from there, once we've identified threats and we eliminate properties nonstop, we, we, we comb through 200 properties a week to produce 10 or 20. And those may make a short list and then they get eliminated based on threats. And so FEMA regions are another threat, you know, hurricane um, areas, tornado alley, tsunami areas, things like that. Um, then we go through the 11 scales of permanence and we go in that order and we look at, okay, what's the climate like? Are there risks in the climate? Is there high annual wind speed, right? Are there extremes on the temperature? Are there risks associated with climate? Because climate the, is the thing you can change the least, right? And then we look at the topography, the geography of the property, you know? Then, then we look at the water, and then we analyze the socioeconomics. And those four things are the things that are the hardest to change, and so we kind of prioritize those. Then we go through and look at access and circulation, zones of use, soil, vegetation, and wildlife, um, buildings and infrastructure and, um, aesthetics and experience. I think that gets us to our 11 and, and we basically evaluate through that full spectrum analysis and then, and then say, Hey, yeah, this property meets those requirements. Cause most people, when they're looking at real estate, all they're looking for is the house. You know, you, you could, you could have somebody who say watches your videos and they're like, yeah, I want to do the Justin Rhodes thing, or I want to do a Curtis Stone thing. And they go to a property and the, for the realtor just shows them the house, right? That's typically what realtors do. And they're mostly fixated on that. And then the, mm -hmm. the property itself is kind of, okay, well, I want some fields and I want some of this, but they're not really thinking through the way that they would live on this property. So that that's kind of what we do is we show them to analyze the full spectrum of it so that they can understand how they can fit into this um, and really what, what oh, so many, I'm sorry, this keeps, that's all right. Go ahead. I got notifications off now. There we go. Uh, I shouldn't have any again, but what is the whole context? Right. And so for us, buildings and infrastructure is way down the list. We're looking at climate, topography, water, socioeconomics, way above that and value that more. And even on topography, 
we pull the lens back. We use Google Earth Pro. We pull the lens back 60 miles and we look at everything in that 60 miles. Are there any threats there? Are, are there any geographical features? You know, you could be down in the lower end of a, a water tributary that floods at certain times of the year. You could be in a delta. You know, we, we look at all those kinds of things and really bring this whole picture into, into place for people. And that my course teaches people how to do that basically. So you can go and learn it yourself because these skills translate very well to developing land as well. You know, as you probably know, you've traveled, you've seen farms all over the world. That really changes the perspective on how you operate at home. Right? Yeah. You learn things and you go, yeah, do this or that. Yeah. I'm thinking about, you know, what people are fake, what, what kind of person, uh, I'm, I'm thinking everybody should do this. If they're, if they're leaving the city and going to the land, what I see is a lot of people are like exactly what you said. They really don't know. They really don't know that one, that they should be looking for a certain type of thing. And then two, they don't know how to do look for that kind of thing. They should know they were looking for. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think I said yeah. that right. Uh, well, no, exactly. Exactly. And so what, what we do is we look at a whole the whole map of North America and we divide it up into five climate regions. Like, are you familiar with the Copen Geiger climate classification system? No. You heard of that? It's 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 a fantastic way of understanding climate. So you probably you you know you understand your USDA zones, right? You're yeah. probably mm -hmm. a zone eight or seven down there. Seven. Seven, yeah. Yeah. And um down in, you know, northern Florida, Georgia, there'd be a zone eight, you know, mm -hmm. get in central Florida, zone nine. And then at the very tip, you'd be a zone 10. And, and, and but very little of the U.S. is zone 10. But the U.S. is very interesting because it goes from a zone three. Yeah. And even in some of the high mountainous regions can be as low as a zone two if you're like super high to zone 10. So the U.S. is one of the most climate diverse places in the world as far as covering a full spectrum of cold climates to warm climates. But what the the Copen Geiger climate classification system does is it groups the climates into five categories. So you've got uh, Arctic, you've got um, boreal, which is so Arctic is self explanatory, places that they are winter pretty much most of the time, and then uh, boreal, which is my climate, which are the, the defined by cold winters with tons of precipitation, uh, like snowy cold winters with hot, dry summers. That's the boreal climates and varying degrees mm. in there. Then the temperate climates, which is you, most of the Southeastern United States from Pennsylvania, from, from central Pennsylvania, down the Mississippi river, all the way across to the East is all temperate and varying different degrees based on your USDA zones. But temperate climates are defined as, you know, humid, hot summers and wet, rainy winters, really. And then you've got arid climates, which are the Montanas, Wyoming's, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah. The arid climates are can can vary in their summers. They can have, you know, hot, it's always hot and dry summer, but the winter is either cold and dry or warm and dry. And then you've got your tropical climates, which are basically only divided into dry and wet. So you got your savanna tropics which are much of like, say, Africa, Central Africa and the interior to um, the temperate um, or the, the, the wet tropics, which most of us are familiar with if you've been to the coastal Mexico regions or, you know, uh, Key West, Florida, Miami is, is that wet, humid tropics. And so we divide the climates into those regions and we get a really good understanding of what it's like to live there. Because if you're, if you're moving from upstate New York, and you want to go and buy a property in Tennessee, you don't mm. really understand what that climate's like until you've experienced it on in, on all sides of the year because it's quite different. Yeah. Like you'll go down the winter and you're kind of like, well, this is kind of cool. It's like not a cold winter. It's a bit rainy, but it's mild out like this. But then you experience the summer and you're like, oh my goodness, August, get me out of here. And then, yeah. you, go, <laughs> then you go up to upstate New York, right? Yeah, and I was joking you earlier about, well, you got air conditioning and heat, but you really do as a homesteader, People need to realize they, you are going to spend a lot of time outside. Oh yeah. So you got to, you got to be ready. So do you help actually help people find stuff in all those climates or are we you do. steering people towards a certain climate? Okay. No, we're, we're everywhere. Um, I would say we're mostly, we, re we reflect what, um, 
what the where the demand is, I should say. And the demand is in the southeast in the United States, hands down. There's just the most amount of inventory. Well, just the east in general. Basically, everything in the U.S. east of the Mississippi, all the way as north as Vermont, and all the way down to Florida. Really Florida's difficult to find properties in. Yeah, it, there's just well, that's where the you know eighty percent of the U.S. population lives east of the Mississippi, right? So I don't know if you knew that. And then and then the other almost 20% live wow. in Southern California. <laughs> That's how the U.S. <laughs> yeah. is broken up. Very That's few crazy. people live in Montana, Arizona. I mean, Arizona, Phoenix is super dense, but the rest of Arizona is super sprawl, is super sparse. So, you know, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, um, even Eastern Nebraska or Western Nebraska, very few people live in those places like they are there's nobody there and so the inventory yeah. is low and the demand is low so yes we have we have listings in our home site accelerator on the entire us pretty much in every state however the vast majority of our listings are just on the east because that's where people are and that's where there's more inventory there's more infrastructure it's the older part of the country you know so there's just more stuff there's more roads there's more everything oh so you've for if people didn't catch that you have a People can come and, and take this course on what to look for in land, but you actually also have listings. Yeah, we have a directory. It's a it's a pretty it's a pretty insane um service we provide. Yeah. Uh, we used to charge a lot for it because it's valuable. I mean, J Justin, I've I've been consulting for as long as I've known you and, and longer. And I one thing that I used to do for people all the time is probably the thing I did the most Thanks. amount of consulting is is finding people farms or homesteads. And yeah. so, you know, they, that happened in a number of different ways, but mostly how it happened is because I, I'm not directly involved in the, I'm not involved in the sale of real estate. Um, but I, but people would basically find properties and then send me like say 10 properties and say, Hey, charge me by the hour and just do an analysis of these properties and tell me okay. what you think. And so I did this, I've done this forever. And, um, that was the, the inspiration for the course was like, man, this is a value. I didn't realize how valuable the skill was until people started paying me for it. And then I thought about this kind of thing for years. And then, and then during, during the COVID panic, um, when I bought my property, I really realized, man, this is a valuable skill. I mean, I scored on this property because nobody else understood how to read the landscape and how to find this, this opportunity because re most realtors just look at houses and fences and like, you know, roads and, and, and just like common infrastructure, but they don't look at topography. They don't look at trees. They don't look at water and all this kinds of things. So I realized that, yeah, we could build a course doing it. So we built that course. It's called finding the perfect homestead property. Um, and then later we built this directory where we were at first, we were charging $400 us a month for this service. And we would basically find properties on the open market for our clients. And so people would sign up to the program. They would fill out this onboarding data and they'd say, Hey, I'm looking in Eastern Tennessee. Hey, I'm looking in um, Eastern Texas or wherever. And then we would just queue up properties every single week and they got a ton of value. Out of it. We had a lot of people that bought their dream home sets because of that. Um, and then, so we found a way to make it cheaper by streamlining the process of trained people that understand it at say a lower level than me, but they can do, the wide capture stuff and then the, all the con the information filters down to me at the end. And then that's when the final reviews go up. But yeah, we found a way where we can publish and we have a directory. So people go onto freedomfarmers.com. They can see our directory. Well, you have to sign up, but that's kind of what, you know, we could offer your audience is like, if yeah. they want to learn this course that I do, we normally sell this course for, what is it? I think it's like a thousand close to a thousand bucks. And what mm -hmm. we're offering, what we can offer you guys is that course for 347. So crazy, crazy cheap. But then we'll throw in six months of our Freedom Farmers Pro package, which gives you for free. So you'll pay the course, you get that course, it's yours. Okay. But then we'll we'll give you six months of Freedom Farmers Pro for free. And if you want to renew it, at six months you can and it's like an annual it's an annual thing um i think we're only asking it might be it's less than 600 bucks but basically it's you get all of our courses 20 plus courses covering a huge section of stuff with homesteading regenerative agriculture market gardening 
uh, microgreens farming, you name it, plus our homestead accelerator directory. So it's insane value for 347. Somebody can take this course, learn the whole process, and then also just check out our listings every single week that we publish um, all over the U S. Yeah. What do you think that's, that's, that's invaluable. What do you think um, the, somebody listening to this, that um, it's just getting started in it all. Or I almost hesitate to say that because there was this huge movement in 2020 and now yes. we have what I call COVID gardens, abandoned gardens or whatever you were yes. saying. People yes. are, are, are leaving now the rural homestead. So what's up with that? And what, what I feel like people are, that was a fear-based decision and they ran out of adrenaline, yeah. so to speak, and you collapsed and you got to have a bigger why. What is the why that you sense in people in your target market? And, and somebody that's who's an easy, right that's for this. Easy. For, Okay. That's, that's easy, Justin. There you it's go. because the throttles of tyranny were dialed back and everybody mm. all of a sudden went, oh, there's no longer a rush to get on the land because there aren't yeah. lockdowns and there aren't mask no. mandates at the stores and there isn't the government saying that you're going to need to take a vaccine to keep your job or whatever it is. That's why. Yeah. And it's a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake. So. Um, absolutely. People don't, don't, stop because yeah. <laughs> this tyranny that that this tyranny that we witnessed was just the the appetizer this was mm. just the introduction to a long mm. haul and i and i've been reading un documents and D world economic forum documents for a long time i'm almost 20 years on my awakening with this stuff um and it was certainly accelerated in 2014 and you know 2016 and then 2020 but um these people, they they want they want the end of the idea of America, right? They want the end of the idea of freedom. They don't just want to, you know, eliminate the Constitution and all that kind of stuff, but they want the culturally the idea of freedom to be gone. That's where you hear all these cliches of "you'll own nothing and be happy." You know, you're going to eat the bugs and all this stuff. They want the average person, and when I say they, I'm just talking about. The, the the big operators and the NGOs and and the you know corporate governance of the UN and the World Economic Forum and these kind of groups, Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Commission, these internationalist globalist groups, they want everybody renting everything for their entire life. They want you living in a pod in a tiny little apartment. And I'm not saying this to fearmonger. I'm just saying right. that this is what they're telling you. And um if you don't want that, you got to get out of the city. You got to get out of the the mm. really um, high dense areas that are really liberal, because mm. this crazy liberal politics. Um, look what look, look all the places that had say drag queen story time before COVID. How did those places doing during COVID? Those are the places mm. that the most most insane people screaming at you for not wearing a mask, freaking out because you're mm. a foot too close to them, right? That those attitudes didn't go away. There's there's still people out there wearing masks. I still see people driving cars wearing a mask by themselves. And so <laughs> these things aren't going away. They they made a cultural impression during that period that's not going to go away. So I think it was a mistake for people to leave. Um, I understand why they did, but um I, I think you gotta stay the course if you're gonna get into homesteading and, and do this, you okay. gotta go through the good times and the bad times. You know, it's like well, I said, well, in market farming, you can make money in good times and you can make bad money in bad times. So it's all good. What is the biggest mistake people are going to make doing this, going off grid, getting a piece of land in the, in, in the rural? What, 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 yeah. What can we tell people who are listening, who are want, wanting to, Hey, yeah, I'm listening to Curtis. I'm going to do this. Good times or bad. This is a good decision for me, no matter what, um, no matter what the future is. I want a legacy for my children. I want to protect them. What do they yes. what do they do wrong that that's gonna lead them the to time. to a burnout and uh quitting down the road? Yeah. Or 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 being too difficult. What do they do wrong initially in getting this property? Or well, in their the number mindset? one thing that well well there's the that the, the, well that's a whole thing too, man. Uh <laughs> that's my, a big I question, mean we can though. get into mindset, but but what I'll tell you on as far as property is concerned is you know that on a homestead, 
there's certain chores that need to be done every single day, right? Yeah. And the way you do those chores is very important because if if the if you when you do those chores day, I, I call it my chore path, the path that I walk out of my house to do the chicken chores, um, whatever it is, uh, irrigation things in the summer, moving animals around, whatever it is, that the, that chore path is a very important path that you take and you walk on sometimes a hundred times a day back and forth. And so what people often uh, fail on is they don't understand the homestead property in the whole context. Like you understand permaculture and the, thinking about the early works of Bill Mollison and the big, in the big designer's manual, talking about that homestead in your zone one, two, and three, right? And even going into the zone four, uh, that's a thing too for larger acreages like mine. Um, but people don't think about the way things are laid out on the homestead and they often make critical decisions mm -hmm. early on that, and you talked about legacy is that if you buy the wrong place and there's just one or two things that are just, ah, the, if you would have saw that it would have saved you so much wasting time because your chore path is inefficient, for example. Or there was one critical design feature and a building put in a way that just didn't make any sense. Or this driveway goes around this and not this way. Or There's so many things. Um, is that when people don't see that, that's where they make mistakes. And then they buy this property and now you got it. Okay. So you realize a year into having this property that, you know, after some hard conversations with your wife and children and family and friends, you're just realizing we bought the wrong place. Now... Mm. A whole world of hurt is in front of you where, okay, now you're going to sell the property or are you going to do some critical things to change some of the things that could have been dealt with at the beginning by just mm -hmm. not getting that property. Now you got a whole world of hurt in front of you. Or the other way is you learn the techniques, you understand what to look for. You don't make the mistakes. You buy the right property. Your chore path is on track. Everything that you needed is there. You got a nice shop with high ceilings. You got a barn for those animals. You got a half decent house that's livable. You got some good road infrastructure. You got some good water infrastructure here. Now you're talking about legacy where that short path that you have to do every single day is now 10 times easier than it could have been if you made the wrong decision. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, that's broad because we could drill down into any of those thoughts and, and where people mess up, but that's where people mess up all the time is they just, they bought the wrong property. And I, I, it, it, it tears my heart to tell people, but I have, I, I tell people in my private consulting, I always say like, Hey, um, I'm just going to tell you the straight goods. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat things. And, and, you know, that's what we try to do at the Homestead Accelerator is basically, eliminate that need to hire me as a consultant because that's expensive and then teach you the techniques and then better yet give you examples because all learning this stuff is all about repetition so in the in the finding the perfect homestead property course i teach you this method going through your context threats negotiables and non-negotiables then mm. the 11 scales of permanence then we go and review 52 properties in every single USDA climate zone in the United States. Okay. 52 properties where we do a full review, videos showing you the property on Google Earth. This is where the water moves here. This is what's going to happen here. Oh, there's a there's a cut block up here. If you don't if you if something if that water were to slide down your property, it could do this. Like doing a full analysis and I even in that course we even show bad properties. So we look at good really good properties which we call A grade. We look at B properties that are need a bit of work, but they could be good. And then C properties, which could be good with a ton of work, or we just show you total failures. And we spend a lot of time in that course showing you the wrong stuff so that you know what to look for if you don't want to make those mistakes. And then in the directory, in the Homestead Accelerator directories, we just show you properties that are winners, whether they're A, B, or C. They're all winners. They all have the fundamentals of food, water, energy, shelter to get, to get on that property and, and make it happen. Where are you sourcing those properties that are that are on point? Do you have somebody scaling the the real estate listings? Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And we have three people working on it full time. Okay, um, Dang. yeah. So we we scour everything. So we scour uh, Realtor.com, Redfin, Zillow. Every we're we're on all the public uh, real estate main internet or national directories, I should say. Um, but we also offer, we let realtors post or people who are just selling their price pr privately. 
we just charge a small fee and people can list their property in our directory as well. So we have a number of members who are selling, you know, the family homestead and they don't want a realtor. And so they just come to us and we don't make any money on the deal. We just charge a fee and then they list it. So that's, yeah. that's where we get our properties. Okay. Well, tell me then what the, uh, the mindset mistake is then. If that's the physical mistake, uh, get something that can't be designed well and have a good chore path. What's the, what's the mindset mistake? Well, the mindset mistake is not being prepared to roll with the punches. That's the number one thing I see is that people, and you, like you said, with COVID gardens, you know, um, people romanticize homesteading because they watch your videos or they watch my videos and they just see the stuff that we're showing them, right? There's obviously a lot of other stuff that's not nice to show, right? There's all those mm -hmm. jobs that nobody wants to do, right? That you and I as dads, we're probably the ones that do those jobs, you know, the really gross jobs that nobody else wants to do. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the problem solving, you know, oh, this irrigation line blew out. Now I emptied my cisterns. Now what am I going to do? You know, all those kinds of things. People don't, um, they're not ready for that sort of warrior mindset that's required where you basically have to just you're outside, it's pouring rain, you're cold, yeah. but this thing that you have to do has to get done. And if it doesn't get done, you're going to be in trouble. Your wife is not happy, right? Or something like that. Right. However, yeah. it's going to go. Or it's something, you know, serious. You know, this dam is leaking. I got to fix this dam. Uh, whatever it could be is that if you don't have that mindset of being ready to just get out there and tough it out, you're not going to last. And, and, and for me, that's that. I, I learned that at an early, a young age, because I was because of tree planting, because of my Canadian bush experience of just getting out in the bush. And we had to plant trees at just above freezing temperatures, downpour torrential rain, climbing up and over slash piles all day. Wet, wet hands, mm. cold, like very inhospitable conditions. And um I learned that's how I learned how to work. And so I learned the hard way, uh, but what, which was the good way is that if a job needs to get done, it's got to get done. It doesn't matter what the weather is. And so, but that's homesteading. And of course you want to, you want to, as you develop your homestead, you want to include systems that make it easier, but there's going to be a period of time when you're front loading the beginning of it, um, that that hard work needs to be done. Right. And that's, that's common in even permaculture dialectics of just front loading the water system so that for the next 30 years, the property moves water in the way that you want so that you get that benefit of that water for those 30 years. This is where good design compounds into that legacy idea of now your children and your grandchildren are taking this land and, and doing something better with it. Yeah, for sure. What would you say? Um, well, I should say this, the, when, when I took my permaculture culture, design certificate i got it from jeff lawton in australia he um i remember going there and with the mindset of you know how am i going to design my own place that already exists and i'm learning where the house should go and i'm like oh crap you know it's it's the typical just where is it oriented to the road and they paid no attention to where the sun patterns are they paid no attention that the house was built in the frost pocket yeah uh, only 50 feet away from the public road um uh, all kinds of things that like you said if even if we were gonna check it on and, and move and list it the realtor wouldn't touch on it wouldn't this is kind of a shame too and maybe we're going a different route with this but it's kind of like they don't value the same things we value uh no you know I would I would put the house above the frost pocket. I would have the living areas towards the south and the in the sleeping yeah. areas towards the north. And it, I would definitely wouldn't put it on the view and on the top of the mountain. You know, keep that sacred and keep not Absolutely. be exposed up there. And uh, but you know, if you were if if you look at a listing, they're wanting to romanticize the view, and you might look at that and you might not have any kind of place where you could put a garden without having some kind of mega, <laughs> uh, trellis, not trellis, terrace. Terrace. Uh, exactly. System. Yeah. And so. that's, 
you know, the, the, the thing is too, is realtors really are a tough bag of people. Like they're, they're, if you ever want to be depressed, you know, meet a bunch of realtors and, you know, I love I, some of my best friends are realtors. It's not, this is not a dig on realtors. It's a dig on say 90% of realtors mm. because most people get into real estate um, because it's an easy thing to do. Like it's, I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing my real estate, <laughs> real estate license. Cause I, it's something I've always wanted to do or for a long yeah. time. Um, but, but it's easy to do. You take, you, you sign up for this course for a couple months and then you write a test and the test is like English proficiency. It's, it's a nothing burger. And so a lot of people can get into real estate because it's easy to get into, but a good realtor will tell you that 90% of the deals are done by 10% of the realtors and 10% of the deals are done by 90% of the realtors. So there's, there's a bunch of realtors out there who just don't really care. They do it because it's easy. It's easy money. They only need to do five deals a year to make 50 to hundred grand, depending on their market. Mm. And they just don't really care. And they're not passionate about it. And mm. so it's, when it comes to homesteads, it's really hard to find realtors that are good. And the other thing that's tough about um, in, in the realtor's defense, the thing that's tough about showing homestead properties is you got to drive, mm. right? You want to go look at some, say you're in uh, you're in Asheville and you want to yeah. move out of Asheville and you want to go and look at properties all around. This one buyer, he's driving around hours and hours to show you properties and not making any money for it until the deal's closed. So a lot of realtors gravitate away from um, rural real estate and they go to condos and single family homes where it's more turn and burn, where it's a five minute drive to do a showing. Right. And so the economics of it kind of makes sense when you think about the quality, but that's what we, that's where we really try to fulfill is front load the information. So that the, the individual, this is going to be one of the most important decisions of your life, you know, besides from say getting married yeah. and having children, buying a homestead property is one of the most important decisions you'll make in your life that if you do it right, you'll have a road of, of gold in front of you. If you do it wrong, you'll have a road of, you know, horse poo poo in front of you. And so if you can do that right out of the gate, it's huge. And so we expect that realtors aren't going to be that great. That's why if you want to buy a good homestead, you it's about taking responsibility. So we yeah. front load the education, help you understand. You can take the course, watch 52 reviews and then just be in our directory and then pick any of the properties that are are still out there. They, they, they're all live and listed and look at any of them. We, we publish 10 to 20 a week. And so you can just constantly learn. And, and, and I would encourage people if they're interested in this offer to even just outside, look at listings and reviews that we do outside of your area just to learn. Cause the more times your eyes can observe certain characteristics in the land, you're just going to get better and better and better at it. And so this is a really convenient way to do it. I drove around forever to find a place and have put in the kilometers and the miles and it's, it's tough. I think they have to, a lot of times they're running to get out of the city and I think you've got it because they also have to run to something. So uh, you spoke on it with your children. This could be something that you could, pass on to them and that's only because you took the time so 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 we want people to take the time and take it really serious and 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 either learn how to pick out a property or put their trust in you and find one you know that's yeah been, that's put through the that's been combed and and go yeah. all in on it and it's worth that investment because my god this is could be forever one, one of the things people got to get into i think is and maybe we're just talking out loud and thinking about this together. I don't know why. Well, um, why people coming through the line? I'm so rooted here. I'm not yeah. moving. Like bury me in a pine box and plant an apple tree over me. Yeah, and yeah, totally. I, I when people say how long you've been here, I say ninety years because Grandpa yeah. got it in 1932. That's right. Yeah, and. uh I'm not going anywhere and um uh, people are transient transient maybe that's the word i was looking for earlier yeah they don't yep. i don't feel they're terribly rooted i don't know if that's a good or bad thing um i don't know i don't either i mean in some ways part of our heritage is transitory you know yeah. people have always migrated you know I've, 
people move I've, around. I've noticed homesteaders tend to be attracted to both being rooted and homestead. I mean, I, I'm the classic example. My God, we would 10, 10 months in a converted school bus. That's right. Going to yeah. every single state. Yep. Uh, we had this it. I don't have that itch no more. That I scratched it. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was actually a search for land that we were coming into. You know, if you grow up into a certain religion, at some point you have to decide, is that my religion? Yes. Uh, or is that my parents' religion? Because mm -hmm. we've always been on this land, I had to make that decision about the land. Because I didn't just inherit it. I had to make my parent, my siblings don't want it, but the way my dad set it up is I need to buy it from them. Yeah. To, to make the the inheritance even because it would have been terribly lopsided if he would have just given me this land. Uh yeah. he was he was asset rich and uh so I had to make a decision, am I gonna buy it? You know, it's interesting us talking here because looking looking across America uh and looking at threats, you know, we went up in Maine, we consider Maine, but it was uh they have with Maine it's very cold, but then it's uh what do you do? and then it's um what am I trying to say? Um oh in, in summer when it's nice, when we were there, they had the crazy mosquitoes. Yes. And, and you got to protect yourself against that. Well, uh, we don't then, have that here. We're dry, but Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's still because of the humidity there. Well, and it's also just the amount of lakes. So for for example, you go into um say eastern Michigan. Okay. Okay. You know, with all those tiny lakes same as northern Ontario, um it's buggy. It's really buggy. It's humid and it's buggy. Um, we're in a drier boreal, so we should, we don't get that. We we'll get some mosquitoes for about a month a year, maybe maybe in kind of uh, May. The month of May might be a little bit buggy, but not. I can still be outside in a t-shirt all day, and it might just be wear a hoodie at nighttime. But yeah, not bad at all. You consider all that. You consider all that in this, and and you Absolutely. walk people through that. There's no perfect place. I mean, that's what we ended up concluding. Is yep. hey. Um. Uh, yep this this is the devil we know versus the devil we don't. You know, there's problems got here. It, we got a we got a public road right going going right through. I mean, we are on a dead end, but we got a public road right through the middle of our property. I mean, it couldn't be more right in the middle of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know, the mosquitoes in Maine, or the uh, only three inches of rain in Arizona, or the um, <laughs> there was a guy in Minnesota. I was editing. He was in there with me. And wife was in there socializing and I'm editing and all of a sudden he says, you know, it gets minus 60 in Minnesota Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is Celsius, but that's so cold. cold. That's minus 60. It's, it's, it's well, I don't, what is that Celsius? Somebody, somebody, uh, I mean, it, it, well, <laughs> Celsius and Fahrenheit line up at more minus 40. So okay. minus 40 is, we don't, I'm not, I nowhere near that cold. I said, don't um, bad things happen at minus 60. He said, yeah, you're, face freezes off and your you get your car won't start yeah. but yeah you know, i couldn't start I, yeah yeah so it'd be interesting to see what kind of listings you have up there in minnesota but well minnesota's uh, a lot colder than here yeah like, way cold isn't that something yeah, we're, it's we're, colder than anchorage alaska minnesota's cold yeah, yeah. and it's because it's humid cold too humid cold is deadly just like humid heat is deadly you know dry heat is so much more tolerable that's what we have up here in the summer is dry heat it's nice it'll be 100 fahrenheit but it'll be no humidity not as dry as arizona but but it's dry and so it's pleasant and then nights kind of cool down a bit which is nice um yeah. but yeah minnesota it's hot and muggy in the summer and and minnesota's on that cusp of temperate to boreal it's kind of an interesting climate region um yeah. because it's the same in vermont and new york those are boreal regions but they still have really fairly wet summers. They still get lots of precipitation in the summer. We get no rain in the summer, zero. Yeah. Like we'll get the, you know, probably less than five rainfalls between May and early October. I'm not kidding. So wow. most of our precipitation comes in the form of snow in the winter, which is really wow. cool if you, if you adapt to it. And that's what I've done on my property is I've done all these earthworks that that I benefit from these main watersheds 
where snow melts into. And I've put ponds there. And so I'm getting millions of liters of water moving through these sheds, which was already naturally happening. But now I can just hold more water there, which is great for fire suppression and for, wow. you know, any, anything else that needs water, <laughs> anything that needs, that is, that is life needs water. Right. All right. What would you say a more um, advanced mistake somebody would make? So, so they think they know what they're doing, or maybe they do know what they do. May, maybe they understand a little permaculture. Maybe they've homesteaded before. What are, what are, what is a mistake somebody who thinks they know what they're doing is going to make? Oh man. I mean, I made a lot of them. Um, <laughs> I made well, okay. What, what were your mistakes there? Yeah. Some of them. I mean, um, one mistake I made that was pretty big was I was really set on putting my house, which is almost done now in, in a place. And I'm glad I did put it there in the end because it is the best place as far as mm -hmm. the way the land is shaped, the view, the aspect towards the sun and all that uh, shielding from the prevailing winds in the winter. It is the best place for that. However, I could have potentially put it in a slightly different place and save myself at least $30,000 on excavation fees. <laughs> and that's okay. where, you know, a little bit more prodding around, um, which sometimes makes mm -hmm. a mess, but a bit more prodding around I could have found. Because the, the challenge I have is I'm on a rocky knob. I'm on a big ridge, not on a primary ridge, uh, on a secondary ridge. And I've got good topography. I've got ridge exposed southeast exposure i've got valleys i've got riparian i've got all kinds of different microclimates here which is lovely and i think that's one thing that makes a property great microclimate actually that's another one of the 11 scales of permanence that i didn't mention microclimate um is that if i spend a bit more time and slow down my design process with the house i was just so eager to design and build my mm -hmm. own house it's a it's a yeah. bucket list item for a lot of guys you know it was for me yeah I'm 44, I'll be 45 this year. I was like, this is a big bucket list. I want to build my own home, passive solar, all the cool stuff about earth ships and all of that. I want to do that. And yeah, if I, if I would have spent, if I would have slowed down on the design and really thought more and basically took a, if I would have started my construction a year later, I could have made some decisions up here where I could have saved a lot mm. of money. Uh, one, Another one, so house location one, because I because I spent about twenty five thousand dollars Canadian to excavate the site that my house is in because my house is bermed into the mountain, which is great because it's got this ICF insulated concrete form basement that's you know bermed into the mountain, so the north side is completely buried, and then it's facing south, so huge windows on the bottom, and then the second floor is above. So from the back of the house, it only looks like a one-story house, but then you walk in and you go down and it's a total um, walkout basement, as they call it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was an expensive excavation because I had to have a 40-ton machine up here for six days straight. And he had the big hammer. The hammer itself weighed 16,000 pounds and it took him an hour to change over. So he could only, and it was the kind of job where it was so rocky that you can only really have an excavator do it. You can't have any other kind of machine come in because the, the the ground is all sharp, jagged rubble. So he would hammer, hammer, hammer for four hours, change the, the implement over, and then he would bucket for another four hours to move the material. And so we got this great impervious, will never be moved building site, but it was an expensive, that's a, expensive to for a foundation before you're even pouring concrete. Another thing I did is that on this site, this there's, I, my property is like kind of like a big piece of pie going down a ridge. So it, it go, going down a mountain. So the bottom of my property is 200 feet lower than the top of my property. And it, it's a big piece of pie coming up. And there's this driveway that winds its way up. And this is a critical thing that the, 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 the first developers of this property made is that they put the driveway for the most part perfectly. And there's two water draws that come down the property that almost go down the piece of pie like this. It's where the snow melts and the water sheds down into these little streams that form seasonally. And the driveway up until the last switchback is between those water draws, which is great because then you don't have to have any culverts crossing uh, the driveways. But then on the last switchback, he crossed over one of them. 
meaning that I had to put two culverts in the driveway. Mm. And so if he would have designed that better, we could have saved those culverts and all that digging. And or what I might have been able to do if I spotted it early enough is I could have just changed the driveway because it didn't even have crush on it when I bought this. And I could have just kept it within the inside of those uh, that water draw and saved having two culverts crossing the driveway. So it's stuff like that, you know? Um, and that's where if you can be on a property, most importantly, during the precipitous time of year, when water's flowing, that's the best time to observe um, earthworks on your property that that are critical is where does water flow? Yeah. Because yeah. water's an asset or it's your worst nightmare. And so it's an asset or liability basically. And so observe where those things happen before you make your critical and um, earthworks on the property. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm almost a fan of, you know, Joel Salatin says, don't put up a permanent fence until you've had a fence there, a temporary one there for three years. I'm, I'm kind of the mind, you know, I was in, a, I'm not a big fan of, you know, planting the fruit trees right away either. Cause they're, they're yeah. permanent, you know, let's make sure we know for sure where they're going to go. There's a lot of pressure to plant a tree, you know, uh, you know, there's that saying best time, best time to plant a tree 20 years ago, next time yeah. now, but you know, I don't know you got, they're so permanent, but it could be that way with the house too. I imagine you're selling a lot of, or you're finding a lot of raw land for people. Uh, you know, if I were, no, to we don't, be just, Oh, you don't, it's all with houses. Well, we, we, we do do raw land, but I actually encourage people to not buy raw land. Oh, really? Why? Be well, because if you stack up the costs, man, I mean, it, I it, it really adds up. Like building costs right now, I mean, in Tennessee, you're looking at 250 to 300 and beyond per square foot building costs. Uh, it's the same in Canadian dollars up here. Um, wow. so building isn't cheap and, 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 you know, if you're, but if you're a good tradesman, there, there's, a, there's a case for it for sure, but it all depends. And, and I always say the yeah. devil's in the details, but when it comes to properties, what I prefer and what is way better value for people is to buy mm -hmm. a homestead property that doesn't have your dream home, but it's orientated in the right way. It's, it's, it sits in the right place. You got a nice, uh, you know, three car garage, uh, uh, you know, a detached garage shop kind of thing. You got a barn for animals and feed. Um, you got a tool shed, stuff like that. Upgrade the house, renovate the house, spend 50 to a hundred thousand on renovation to get it better. Put in new windows, I see. you know, change the plumbing or electrical if you need to. Uh, we see a lot of value in Kentucky and Amish properties and then upgrading those because you can buy yeah. crazy value in Kentucky. Um, uh -huh. So do that because to go raw land, put in the driveway, clear the land, all these things, they really add up. Yeah. And so when you hear a raw land, you're talking, what you hear is forested, no roads, no water tapped, nothing. And that's what we're talking about with raw land, right? M mostly. Yeah. Because if you're buying raw land in, in say your region or some of the sort of agricultural zones of, yeah. Missouri, Kentucky, whatever, they're raw land and they were just used as a farm lease and they're often a subdivide on a larger section. So somebody subdivided out, say, 80 acres, there's a barn there, a road, like those kinds of raw lands are pretty good if you can find them. And we do list some of those properties. Um, but yeah, for the most part, when I'm talking raw land, it's like there's not, there's nothing there. I'm glad and I, I brought that up. Not do it. I yeah. would have thought, I would have thought maybe you would have liked it's raw a mistake land. people make. If, if somebody gets raw land, I would say, well, did you buy raw land? No, I gave up on it because I couldn't. That's what I was looking for at first because that's what I wanted uh, to do. The that's whole funny. Thing. Always and then my that. wife, it was actually my wife's suggestion. She's like, why don't we just start looking for places with a house? And even if it's not a perfect house. <laughs> and I said, yeah, okay. And we found this place. This place yeah. was cheaper. It had a little house. It's this little cabin we live in. We still live in it until our house is our main house is done. But it it it's okay. It functions. But yeah, um, it gave us a place to stay. Whereas without that, I would have been living in a yurt or an RV yeah. and had way mm -hmm. more uncomfortable circumstances. And so yeah, it's and better that's to not start realistic where you are. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad we brought that up. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about uh, the this 365 film that you guys submitted into the film festival did did does it relate 
to any of this. They were talking, just to be fair, I only skimmed it. I didn't I want to watch it live with everybody else. Not not so. really. I mean, they're they're their own unique couple. You know, they're in the okay. in the coastal region of British Columbia. I think they're on one of the islands. And um they just I think it was Chris, Chris the 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 the, the, okay. the 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 husband, it was his idea to be let's just go out on the land. And I think they did this during COVID too, actually. So it was kind of you know similar experience to what I had is that he just said, let's go and see if we can live completely off the land for a year, not buying wow. any food. Yeah. So it's hardcore. And so he, but Chris is a pretty amazing dude. I mean, he grew up fishing and, and foraging and stuff like that. So he had a pretty strong foundational knowledge and experience, but his wife didn't, she didn't, she was totally green. So they went out and just did it. And the documentary is basically sharing their journey and it's, it's hardcore. Like it's like, we're, I'm not even that hardcore right now. I mean, right. we are in other ways because we're off grid with our power and you know, we're, we're, okay. we're off grid in, in other ways. Like I look at food, water, energy, shelter, right? Like four things you need to live. Yeah. And so they just dialed the food in and yeah, it's, it's hardcore. I mean, it's well, uh, especially when, when it's horticultural, right? When it's not just raising animals, they did that too. But he's out fishing and 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 hunting and stuff like that as well. Well, let's talk about that. There's a there's a idea that if if you're off grid, you have to go. You're you have to be hardcore. But Curtis, you're in a well lit room. You got a cello back there. Uh, you yeah. we've talked about air conditioning and heating. Uh -huh. So b bust that myth or confirm it right now about about yeah these off grid. Well, it's, it, it just comes down to money, really. Like how, how much money do you yeah. want to spend? You know, like you said earlier too, there is no, the, there is no perfect homestead property. Well, there is, if you got the money, right. <laughs> and so it, it all yeah. comes down to, and that's like what I'm looking to do, set people up with is, is build them and, and sell them. That's something I'm interested in doing eventually. Yeah. But um, because I, I, I do want to build a perfect homestead property. I really do. I, I think it can exist uh, with the right resources, but yeah, I mean, it's all a compromise. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, our off-grid system is pretty skookum. Like, it's uh, it's way more hardcore than most would do. It's basically an off-grid system for a small community. Because um, okay. we'd like eventually like to have other homes up here and uh, not for sale, but just, you know, within our family and stuff. Um, so, it can power all of that. And so, yeah, no, we, we've got all the creature comforts, you know, off-grid. Um, the thing is with off-grid power, though, it is a lifestyle thing because there are times that the lights just won't come on and you got to figure out why. You know, it does yeah, happen. I yeah. got I, I got on a plane to Mexico. I haven't left the homestead for three years. I haven't flown in three years. And I used to fly all the time. I was, I've been to 50, 45 U.S. states. I've traveled around and been all over the world teaching farming and stuff. And during COVID, I'm, I'm not flying. <laughs> I'm not taking a shot. So, so I didn't travel. And I, I kind of adapted my career without travel. And it was, it's, I'm glad I did. Uh, but I did go and speak at that Anar Anarco Poco conference down in Acapulco, Mexico, a few weeks ago. And I said to my wife, uh, I'm not going to leave the homestead during winter because snow is a big deal up here. And yeah. it, it requires mm -hmm. quite a bit of work and managing, you know, and, and that's yeah. my role until my son or my daughter are old enough to do it. Uh, my wife's busy on the, inside the homestead that she's got enough to deal there. And so I do that stuff. But the snow melted the, early. And so I, I I decided to go to Anarcopoco because they they had a spot for me and I okay let's go. The day I left, Justin, it was all, all the snow was melted. The day I left, the mm. next day it snowed for thirty six hours straight. Oh my god! And my, my wife and kids were snowed in and completely <laughs> unable to leave the homestead. But we've prepared for this. But the thing that also was terrible is she left the Tesla plugged in to the mm. off grid power system overnight completely drained the batteries okay oh no so so she is we don't even have cell service up here she had to get to a part on our property where she could get a little bit of cell service she texts me i wake up totally jet lagged from you know 24 hours of travel i just exhausted in the morning in mexico she's like hey there's no power and we're snowed in and i'm going oh. the one thing That's that i was so trying to stressful. not have happen happened but you know what we troubleshooted it. We got it. We got through it. And I'm glad, okay. I'm glad it happened because it tested the resilience of the system, which is important because if your system and some people make these really nebulous off-grid systems that are so 
nuanced and you got to know every little thing and and old school off gridders will always tell you that there's just always these little things and nobody can manage the system except them but we figured it out and i'm glad we did because she i troubleshoot shoot her through boom the system lit back up no problem but it nice. was you know for half that day i was just going oh my goodness the day i leave everything goes wrong but you know it was a it was a testament to the system and so our system is pretty 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 top of the line i've spent about $130,000 on it canadian it's got 20 kilowatts of solar we've got 100 kilowatt hours of battery storage i've got a 13 kilowatt diesel generator with 600 liters yeah. of stored fuel and so like yeah even rebecca could do that i think that that's i think tough. so <laughs> i think so uh okay yeah so as a reminder, if folks they if folks can see this film of the 365 uh, in the upcoming film festival, you help produce it, I imagine. And then uh, for this for for folks to learn the the eleven, uh, what was it called? There eleven. Eleven on the land. Yeah, uh, you know to 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 not only learn how to find their homestead, to then tap into a directory. Do they just go to freedomfarmers.com for both of those or where yep. do they go? They get okay. they get everything at Freedom Farmers. All, all the from, from the field.tv is all in there now too. We consolidated okay. it in. Okay. So so that's all in there. That's called the video vault. And so everything's at freedomfarmers.com. So I'll I'll make I'll, I've got a link for you to yeah. share with your audience. That'll get okay. them to that course and this deal. So this deal okay. is better than anything we have. It's so that you're paying for the course and then you get six months of freedomfarmers.com with the 20 plus courses we have, the Homestead Accelerator. We have a whole social media, private social media group in there with a map where you can find people yeah. of like mind in, in, in areas that you want to go to. And um, yeah, it's a real kind of all in one thing for people to have a yeah, lot of that, solutions to solve for them. And I imagine it won't always be on sale. It's a sale right now. So they, they need no, to this see this yeah, and get on need, it before you change your mind. To, <laughs> that's right. Th this deal, I'm just looking at my notes here. To, was, what's the time on this one? Let me just Well, you look that up. I'll say this. You, that's what yeah. I was getting at with community and loneliness is uh, it, 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 it people also assume that too but it doesn't have to be i mean with the internet now we can connect with people online and then actually form real relationships and find one another and, and that that turn into physical relationships i mean we you and i knew each other digitally before and then just over time uh you know eventually rub sh shoulders we, yeah and that, and that's what that's what makes it right that it's yeah. the real it's the connection of people in the real world makes it so yeah. use these tools you know, use these tools. They're great tools, but build the relationships offline, man. It's it's now more now more important than ever to to, oh, to yeah. get connect with people offline because this, you know, all these conveniences that are being provided for us, they can take them away. And we saw during yeah. COVID that's what they want to do. They want to entice you in with all these conveniences that make your life so much easier. You never know. You never knew you needed the thing until they told you about it, but. Um, then they take it away. And, you know, there's talks about digital ID and all this in the world that can look for them. They want to, you know, hopefully you and I can stay online, but there might come a time where we're not online because we yeah. don't want to take a shot or, or go along with the next stupid thing that they want you to go along with. Yeah, you're right. You know? And I think this is a good thing. Uh, either way. I mean, Hey, you know, you, I, I feel like it, it, it provides this security which is our first instinct to get secure and safe. Yep. But it just so happened. It's not like we're saving beans. You know what I mean? We're not, we're not stockpiling beans and rice. We're building something yeah. that is going to, that is going to continue to give, you know, it's going to, the, the grass is going to get better every year and the, and the fruit trees are going to become more abundant every year. And so that when your children step into it, good times are bad. They're enjoying the fruit. That's exactly it, man. And I, I've always said that it's, there's never been a better time to get into farming or homesteading. And even because when I started urban farming, mm -hmm. I was, it was good times. The economy was good. I was okay. selling to high end restaurants, making premium money on, on a premium product. But even during bad times, farming's valuable because people need to eat. Yeah. So farming mm -hmm. is valuable yeah. in good times and bad times. And the, th the thing you have to find is that center of being grounded 
and understanding that the process and the journey is actually the most beautiful part about it. That's right. And, 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 and you have to like that home. You have to like that lifestyle, right? Some people aren't ready for that lifestyle and, and that's fine. But yeah. if you like the lifestyle, I'm not homesteading out of fear. I'm homesteading out of, I love life and I want to experience God's creation in nature as best as I can and be around that more often than man's creation in the cities. And I want my I children to understand yeah. God's creation because that's how they learn. So when they're out there exploring nature and looking at all the sticks and plants and the bugs and all that stuff, they're learning everything. And uh, it's foundational. Yeah, that's good. That's probably a very good note to end on. That's a happy ending right there. So yeah, I'm going to leave the links for everything that we've mentioned, the film fest, yep. the, the course, the directory, all that. So I'll leave that. And I think it's a good thing you're doing. And yeah, when 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 you reached out earlier with some of the new stuff you're doing, because we haven't talked in a little bit, I was like, yeah, this is exciting. And I think my audience will benefit this from this greatly because the much much of them are just getting started. And they really yeah. need to, I really believe that they could make some mistakes, but those could be easily mitigated by investing in them themselves and getting some training before they dive in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks for having me, brother. Enjoy your day.